Marx's colleague, he expressed frustration that there wasn't this revolution wasn't coming in London. He says, why isn't it coming? And he said this in a, he said this in a letter and he said, the reason is one word. You know what he said? Spurgeon. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debates, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're going to be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seem to be too toxic. At Tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at Tomap.com, and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. Today we're discussing Karl Marx versus Charles Spurgeon, a, an epic struggle in mid-19th century London for the souls of men, and I'm looking forward to covering this today. But before we get to that, I want to say a little something about this podcast. Our goal in Ideas Have Consequences isn't to do what so many conservative podcasts do. That is to say, I don't just want to come on here and express perpetual outrage. Look at look at what they're doing at the Biden White House. Look look at there's these, you know, these gay drag shows, you know, or whatever. That's not what I want to do on every episode of a show like this. Rather, instead of giving you an avalanche of depressing information each week and then just leaving you feeling like you want to slit your wrists, <laughs> rather my goal is to help you connect the dots, to help you understand the issues, to help you navigate the culture. But I want to go even further than that. What I, what I ultimately want to do is to give you the confidence to engage 
the culture, to begin to push back. Because, ladies and gentlemen, what I think we're seeing in the culture is the tail wagging the dog. Uh, I, part, of, part of the tactics that are being employed here are to give you a sense of there's nothing you can do. They're just apathy, inaction, that you won't, you won't do a thing. You'll just sit on your hands. No, you need to engage. And that's part of the reason why I've chosen to discuss today Marx versus Spurgeon, because here you have in Charles Spurgeon, a man who was pushing back against the culture in his own time, and he did so without the benefit of hindsight. He didn't see what we saw. He didn't know what we, we know now. There were no Marxist countries at the time. There had been no Marxist genocides at the time. He didn't have the benefit of history to look back on, but he knew his Bible so well that he could perceive that it was a dangerous and evil uh, man-hating ideology. And so what I want to do here is to equip you I want you to have the confidence to go out and engage your, your neighbor over the backyard fence, to uh, engage a colleague at the water cooler, uh, at the lunch table, uh, even, even in your churches. Sadly, we have to do some of this in our churches these days, don't we? I mean, uh, honestly, uh, many churches, dare I say most, you know, are, are penetrated by this woke ideology. And finally, what I want to do is encourage you. I Yes, some of the things that we're discussing on this podcast are heavy. They're heavy. They're difficult issues. That's why I listen to a lot of sports radio. You know, sometimes I'm looking, I'm just looking to go and watching old movies because I'm just looking to escape some of the depressing information that we see coming through news media, that we see on social media, and so forth. So I want to put a bounce in your step. I want to remind you that we serve a mighty God. We serve the God who said, let there be light. We serve a God who surrounds us with a host and who is ready to go before us. Now, I know some of you who watch this podcast don't believe that. There are many who have followed my work for a very long time as we have engaged on a variety of, dare I say, intellectual issues from atheism and Islam and um, you name it, scientific issues that have followed my work for a very long time. And they do so even though they don't believe in the God of the, the Bible, the uh, Jesus Christ, as I do. Fine. I'm glad to have you along. You don't, you don't have to agree with me to watch this podcast. I hope that in some way it's helpful to you too. I hope it challenges your thinking. I know that not everyone who adheres to a a, shall we say, a conservative worldview is a Christian. That's okay. I want you to be encouraged as well, but I want you to be clear on what my goals are in here. As I have said in previous podcasts, my mission statement, my personal mission statement is found in 2 Corinthians 10.5. At least it's the mission statement of this podcast. And there the apostle Paul says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion or pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. That is what I do for a living. I destroy arguments and I construct arguments. That's what we do on this podcast. So I just want you to be clear on this. And it seems that it's meeting a real need. We have, here we are, what, two, three weeks in to this podcast. I mean, it's, it's a very new project for us. And we have, I think, about one and a half million YouTube downloads across four episodes. So it's pretty amazing what's, what's happening there. And it's my hope through that that, um, that the Lord himself is, you know, is glorified and honored in what we say and do on this show. And I sort of feel like Thomas Aquinas who said, let, let the good parts remain and let everything else fall away. So any of the things that I say here that, that, that do, are not reflected in eternal truth, let's just let all that, let's just let all that stuff go straight out of, out of your mind. So... Karl Marx versus Charles Spurgeon. It occurred to me some years ago that Karl Marx and Charles Spurgeon lived in the same London at the same time. They breathed the same London air. And next to the United States, our biggest following is in the UK. And so all the UK viewers, you know, welcome to this 
show. I hope that what we say here is helpful to you, to you too. But whenever I'm there, there are two grave sites I always try to go to. And um, the first one lies in North London at Highgate Cemetery. Among the 53,000 graves that one finds there, there are a few notables. Michael Faraday, who's the inventor of the electric motor, is buried there. Adam Worth. You don't know who Adam Worth is? Promise you, you do. Do you know who Adam Worth is? Do you know who Adam Worth is? No, you don't, but you do. Because Adam Worth was the real life um, basis for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's evil Moriarty in the Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, those guys are buried there. Uh, Adam Worth, by the way, is interesting in reading. It wasn't nearly so evil as, you know, as Moriarty. He was a he was a thief, but he was a very clever thief. And uh, what a name, Adam Worth. You know, so this is a guy who was trying to always improve his net worth. So this was what he was about. But those guys are buried there. And it's also the resting place and the site of what is really a monument. It's, it's quite large, granite, I think. It would hit the ceiling in here. And that is Karl Marx. Karl Marx is buried there. I, I'm tempted every time I'm there to urinate on his grave. I just want to say at the outset, that I am not a Marxist. I'm not a fan of Charles Marx. Excuse Charles Marx. I'm thinking of Charles Darwin, who will come up later in this discussion. I'm not a fan of, uh, of Karl Marx, though he was a Prussian, which is to say German. We'll just say German. Marx lived the last 34 years of his life in London. And um, there he refined his radical secular ideology and produced Das Kapital, Capital. It was his book on capitalism. And he set loose upon the world from London ideas that have wrecked half of it and still threaten to wreck the other half of it. The second grave lies in South London at West Norwood Cemetery. Among the 42,000 graves that you find there, there are also a few men of some renown. Paul Julius Baron von Reuter. Can you guess what he's founded? Reuter News Service. He's, he's, which is still a gargantuan you know, news service to this day. He's buried there. So also is Hiram Maxim. Hiram Maxim, the inventor, the inventor of the first portable, fully automatic machine gun. Um, the Maxim machine gun was the great killer of World War I, sat on a tripod. It, uh, it killed far more people than did artillery. That, that guy's buried there. He's buried there. But so also is our hero of this story, and that's Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers. Spurgeon was the 19th century's British equivalent of Billy Graham. He pastored what was allegedly the largest church congregation in the world at the time. It would be dwarfed by today's American megachurches, but it was enormous by the standards of that time. And anyway, it's just incredible to me that these two guys lived in London at roughly the same, I mean, at the same time, not roughly the same time, at the same time. Their lives overlapped a little bit like this. Karl Marx was older. Karl Marx was born in 1818 uh, and died in, um, in 1883. Spurgeon was born in 1834 and died in 1892. But their, the, the peak of their careers overlapped. And here they are working in the same city at the same time. And both were, in a sense, evangelists contending for the souls of men. Um, and they had competing visions of humanity. And it's important that you understand that Marxism is a competing vision of humanity humanity. It isn't just economics. It isn't just economics. It is a worldview, and you must understand that. And if you don't understand that, hopefully by the end of this, this podcast, you will understand that. Um, and they're both offering, and, and they're not just competing visions of humanity, they're competing visions of salvation. One of, the, one of them is the secular version of salvation. And the other is, of course, the biblical, which is to say the only real salvation. I am delighted that there are a number of Muslims who follow this podcast. I have debated 
a number of Muslims. I've debated them in Hyde Park, London, which is where the real ones gather. <laughs> I've done that with my, uh, with my good friend, Jay Smith. You can catch him, by the way, I think, on YouTube. Jay, all he does is take on Muslims, and you need to give him a look. But I've taken him on there. I've taken him on on CNN International, which was kind of a waste of time because she was sort of a hippie Baptist Muslim, and <laughs> you know, formerly Baptist Muslim, and, um, and then on Al Jazeera. Uh, Zaid Shakir, I took on on, uh, on Al Jazeera before an audience of 260 million. I only mention them because... I am grateful for the Muslims who follow this, this podcast. Um, I want to, want to be very clear. I believe that the, the Jesus Christ that Charles Spurgeon preached, the Jesus Christ that we find in the Bible is the only means of salvation. Jesus said one of the most politically incorrect statements of all time, maybe the most politically incorrect statement of all time, and it's the one the world wrestles with. It's the one the secular elites wrestle with, not just Muslims, but secular elites wrestle with. Can you guess what it is? It's John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus said that, he annihilated any other means of salvation. He says, no one comes to the Father except by me. Just me, your only means of salvation. Now, you can watch this and you can disagree with that. You're free to do that. God is a respecter of your choices. So am I. <laughs> Who am I to set the standards? If I were setting the standards for heaven, I would set the bar a lot lower. <laughs> I would set it at least as low as I am. <laughs> so I would at least do that. But I simply want to say at the front end, because some of you are going to, you know, come into the comments are going to say, ah, you know, I don't believe any of that. So I want to make sure you understand uh, my, my Muslim brothers who are out there. I just want to say this to you. I enjoy taking you guys on because you really believe something. Now, I'm not talking about the ones who are fuzzy westernized Muslims. I'm talking about the ones who believe the Quran, who believe the Hadith, and who model their lives after Muhammad as every Muslim is supposed to do. I admire you guys because you believe something. And when you guys convert to the Christian faith, you really convert. I mean, it's Pauline conversion. You're going this direction, and then you go that direction. And Charles Spurgeon was making those kinds of converts, powerful converts. And he was competing with, not Islam in his time, he was competing with the secularism of London, which, by the way, is far more dangerous than Islam, or even what we call radical Islam, which is really just orthodox Islam. Secularism, secular, secular regimes, which is to say atheistic regimes, which is to say socialistic, Marxist, fascist regimes, have killed no less than 150 million people in the 20th century alone. Mao by himself killed about 70 million of his own people. That is more than all religious wars from all previous centuries combined. So don't give me your crap in the comments on about, oh, but religion kills. No, it doesn't. Even if you lump the Crusades, which weren't Christian, by the way, at least aspects of them weren't Christian. I mean, it's very easy to compare it to what Jesus himself said. Even if you combine the Christian faith with other religions, you begin to see that the Christian faith isn't really ultimately about bringing, you know, genocides and this sort of thing. And Charles Spurgeon was preaching Christ crucified. He was preaching aggressively a Christian faith that was about regeneration of the soul. And at the, at the same time, on the other side of the city, Karl Marx was preaching salvation through bloody revolution. So one is preaching bloody revolution. The other one is preaching the blood of Christ. There is a big difference between those two. And it's going on in London at the same time. The London of Marx and Spurgeon was the center of world governance at the time. You've, you've heard the phrase that the sun never set on the British Empire. It was literally true. This tiny island that you could fit inside the state of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, not particularly big, governed roughly 25% of the Earth's surface at the time. Incredible. And um, it was also the center of, of epic-defining ideas. I mean, just think about it. With Queen Victoria's missionaries to civilize her empire and her ministers and armies and navy to rule it, 
the British Empire was at the time at the zenith of her power. David Livingston was searching for the source of the Nile, and you had Charles Darwin penning The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, a racist book, by the way. Charles Darwin was a racist straight through. Britain was at the forefront of everything that was considered to be progress at the time. But it was also a Britain that convulsed with the problems that were endemic to massive social change. So much so that an air of revolution kind of hung over the Britain of this era, and especially London, like ominous storm clouds gathering on the horizon. It seemed that at any time there might be a French Revolution-style event in Britain. And um, and the, the British government was, of course, keenly aware of this, and hence the reason that there were a number of reforms that were taking place at this time. But still, it was this was the bare-knuckled phase of the Industrial Revolution, and the urban poor crowded slums and populated the novels of Charles Dickens. You know, if you've read any Charles Dickens, you, you get a sense for what life was like for the urban poor at this time. So it was a combustible atmosphere that Karl Marx stepped into in 1849 when he moved to London. He came to London because he'd been driven out of most of Europe. He had been banned, um, exiled from most of the countries of Europe. And here he is coming to London from Paris with revolution on his mind. And of course, revolution had always been on his mind because he sought to overthrow various governments, and he was always causing turmoil. Once in London, Marx, who was an apostle of evil, he was an apostle of hate, spent his days at the British Museum preparing his magnum opus capital, Das Kapital, a critique of capitalism that could fill a sizable pothole. In those days, the, you know, today, um, the, the British Museum, if you have a chance to go to the British Museum, you absolutely should. But in those days, the British Museum and the British Library were combined, and now they're separate. They're, they're not in the same place. But so that's why he was there. He wasn't there just walking around looking at, oh, Rosetta Stone. <laughs> you know, he was, he was there writing. <clears throat> and although he fashioned himself as a scholar, Marx, according to Paul Johnson, you should read Paul Johnson. I love Paul Johnson. Paul Johnson wrote a little book, a delightful little book called Intellectuals. I should have put it on here today so that you would know. I I try to put the books on here that I'm reading at the time and that some of you are very observant to pay attention to what the books are that I have sitting here. And uh, but that's one that's missing today. And you should add, is he the late Paul Johnson? January of this year. January of this year, we lost him. I think he was in his 90s. And Paul Johnson was, in my opinion, he was a great man, certainly a great writer. And I'm so grateful for his, his scholarship. But his book, Intellectuals, he, he speaks of, and I would agree with this in my own research on Marx, he thinks that, that Marx was a poser. Uh, that is to say, a fake intellectual, a dilettante, a, um, a pretender a dabbler in scholarly activity. And by that, he didn't mean that he wasn't intelligent. He just meant he, Marx lacked the self-discipline. Maybe he had the mind for it, but he lacked the self-discipline to really, really master and study a single subject. What he was quite good at was producing punchy articles more than a book. And, um, and it's important that you understand this because we're, we're seeing something in media today in a very big way that is unsettling. And, and that's this, that a, a scholar begins with a tentative thesis, and then he allows the facts to dictate his conclusions. He is, in other words, committed to the truth. So he begins with a thesis that says, you know, Adolf Hitler was the engineer of the Holocaust, and he lets his research demonstrate where whether or not that's true, and he adjusts his thesis as the facts dictate. That's not what's happening these days, and 
And um, you see media these days, a lot of so-called scholars um, doing what Marx did, and that is this. He began with a thesis, or rather he began with a conclusion, and then he worked backward from it, discarding all contrary evidence. I recall a um, you know, book being written some years ago that, 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 was, uh, that portrayed, I had, I had dinner with the author of this book. He's, so the book is called American Aurora. Um, I've forgotten the, uh, the author's name, doesn't matter, but he, in it, the, the author of the book, a Yale historian, I think, he portrays um, Washington as a sort of a bungling fool. And he used the American Aurora, which was an early colonial newspaper, like, like the National Enquirer, as a primary source, uh, that, that is, for his conclusion. In, in other words, he began with that conclusion, he worked backward from it, and then he discarded any evidence that didn't fit his thesis. That's not scholarship. That's not scholarship. And this is the way, this is the way Marx went about doing these kinds of things. Here's, here's a good little line for you from the Communist Manifesto, which was published just a year before he got to London, 1848. Communism abolishes eternal truths he declared. How arrogant can you possibly be <laughs> to say that you, your ideology, abolishes all eternal truth? I'm here to declare myself an oracle of truth unto myself. This is what Marx did. He went on to say, it abolishes all religion, all morality, instead of constituting them on a new basis. That is in the Communist Manifesto. I'd encourage you to read it. If you read it, you will, it's, it's not big. It's, I don't know, maybe 100 pages. It's, it's, it's maybe less, I don't know, but it's probably downloadable on uh, you know, something like Kindle or something for free, you know, because well past its copyright. And uh, it's, it's not difficult reading, but when you do read it, your eyes will begin to be open because you'll go, oh, wow, I'm seeing that in, in um, Black Lives Matter, you know, in their ideology. Their ideology originally on their website said, we are about the destruction of the family. I mean, they openly declared that. They were criticized for it, and so they've removed it from their website now. But I promise you, it was on the Black Lives Matter website. And he says this, abolish the family along with the hallowed correlation of parent and child. Does this sound familiar to you today? Of course it is. I, I think I'm going to do a future podcast on parental rights and why the left seeks to destroy them. Now, an obvious reason for that is in order to create themselves as the primary source of information and primary influence in the lives of children, but it's also to make the state an object of worship. But I, I would like to discuss in a future podcast uh, what's driving that ideology, where that ideology uh, came from, and why the left is still pushing that now. We see that in public schools, but it goes back to Marxism. They were pushing this in a very big way. And much like, much like Hitler's Mein Kampf, which was published in you know, 1925, no one could say that they weren't warned, forewarned, about what Marxism is because Marx was openly stating what it was, more so in the Communist Manifesto than in Das Kapital. Das Kapital is, is you know, it's like, like an old headmaster of mine used to say, it's like swimming in grits. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's, like, it, it's like this. It's, it's not an easy read and it's, it's full of factory you know, uh, data and this kind of thing. The Communist Manifesto is very easy. It's quite punchy and, uh, and interesting. And you will be, find yourself underlining all kinds of crazy things that this madman uh, wrote and said. Marx was also lazy, like the socialists of any era, by the way. He didn't mind accepting monetary handouts from capitalists. His uncle was the founder of Phillips Electric. I mean crazy amounts of money. And he was constantly going to him, you know, for money. That's the interesting thing about many socialists. Socialists, Black Lives Matter has taken in billions, billions. The founder of Black Lives Matter, I think she has what, seven homes? Seven homes? 
In other words, they're fleecing people to push their evil agenda. If you ever went to any communist country, as I have, I've been to several, what you would discover is the idea of annihilating you know, class structure and putting everybody on, on the same equal plane never happens. What you end up with are communist bosses who drive nice cars. They live in big apartments or big houses. They have a special lane. The Russians had a special lane that the party bosses got to drive in on their roads. Everybody else is stuck, you know, in traffic, not them. They had like their own HIV, HOV lane. I think we could give it another name, but evil bastards lane. I mean, that's, that's what they had is, uh, is their own lane. This is what happened. And Marx was this kind of guy. Like Bernie Sanders too, you know? Yes. How many homes now? Sitting around saying, I need your financial support. Yeah, precisely. Exactly like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, they're all pushing for this stuff. While at the same time, pushing something for you. So we've been talking about globalists, you know, on this, this show who use, some of them use Marxist tactics, but they're really fascists. That might be a future podcast as well as uh, explaining that. But again, flying around the world in their private jets and saying, reduce your carbon footprint. You guys eat bugs. Now, if I had a private jet, ladies, I want to be clear. I am not class resentful. If you are rich, good on you. If you've done it, you know, honestly, you inherited it or you earned it, good for you. If I could fly private, that would be my chief luxury in life. You know, I, I would fly private, but I wouldn't go around the world telling people to reduce their carbon footprint. I would say, hey, if you can fly private, fly private too. <laughs> um, but that's not, that's not what they do. It's interesting because... There's no evidence that Karl Marx, who was all about industry, writing about capitalism, he was talking about the evils of industrialization, there's no evidence that he ever set foot in a factory. Not once in his whole life. His mother bitterly complained that she wished that her son would accumulate capital instead of just writing about it. <laughs> that, that's a pretty witty remark by Mama Marx. Um, she nailed it in that. In spite of other would-be revolutionaries before and since, Marx was a Manichaean. That is to say, he was a guy who divided the world into two camps, the revolution and its enemies. And these were simply defined as those people who agreed with him and those who didn't. If you agreed, if you agreed with Karl Marx, who was a bitter, bitter man, then you were a friend to the revolution. If you disagreed with him, then you are an enemy of the revolution. And this, by the way, defines pretty much all revolutionaries. From Lenin, Stalin, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, all of them. You either agreed with him or you didn't. It, it, slight variations in philosophical outlook they, they were intolerable to them. Hence the Russian Civil War. I mean, you had, the, you, you had different branches of socialism fighting each other, different branches of Marxism, fighting each other and killing each other by the millions. They learned this lesson from Karl Marx, who was utterly intolerable to, well, he's intolerable to other people, but he was utterly intolerant of other, other, other um, opinions. You either accepted his opinion. Engels said this of him, actually. Friedrich Engels, who was his colleague, together they wrote Conditions of the Working Class in England in 1848. And um, kind of an expose on the things that Charles Dickens was writing about. They were exploiting it to say, hey, give up capitalism, give up democracy, and overthrow the government and put us in charge. But Engels, Engels made this observation of Marx. He said, you must work, worship at his altar or you are not his friend. You must, must worship at his altar. You're not his friend. And Marx was also, um, he's racist and an anti-Semite. He attacked one opponent as a Jewish N-word. You find this in his writing. This guy does not deserve, ladies and gentlemen, he deserves nothing but your scorn. Barring something we don't know, I promise you he's in hell. 
This is not a man who is enjoying eternal comforts. Or is he believed that he just simply ceased to exist? No, he exists. He's lingering on somewhere unhappily. <laughs> I, I'm reminded of, of what, what was his name? Cheney, Dick Cheney, after uh, um, they started bombing, you know, looking for uh, Osama bin Laden. And they said, is he alive or have you killed him in an interview? And he says, I don't know, but wherever he is, he ain't happy. <laughs> so wherever Karl Marx is right now, he ain't happy. To read Marx's personal letters or his published works is to encounter a bitter, evil mind concealing a hate in what he and others promoted as a noble vision of humanity. I like what J.M. Thompson said. Historian J.M. Thompson said this, a man is never so dangerous as when he can identify a personal grievance with a matter of principle. That is to say, some of the, the, the most evil people in history, this is Obama, by the way. Obama, I, in my opinion, is a very bitter but clever, devious mind. He says all the right things in public, while behind the scenes, his administrations were exceedingly corrupt and full of cronyism. But he hid his bitterness, he hid his hate behind a principle. He gave it a noble veneer. This is what a lot of people do. This is what they do in, in, in their personal conflicts with you. You find yourself in a personal conflict and a person puts their hate for you, they, they put on their hate for you a veneer of principle that it's really a good thing. And um, this was true of of uh, Karl Marx. It was true of Lenin. It was true of Stalin. It's true of Mao. They say all the right things in public. Bettering humanity. This is the World Economic Forum. Principle on top, evil on bottom. That's what this is about. And all you have to do is read Marx. Go read it and you'll find out. It wasn't a noble vision. That vision, the noble vision, the vision of real salvation was found in the preaching of Charles Spurgeon, going on on the other side of, the, of London at the same time. He burst upon the scene in London in 1853. Spurgeon was merely 20 years old when he was appointed pastor of a congregation at the new Park Street Chapel in South Central London. 20 years old, imagine that. Soon, his earnest, passionate messages were attracting huge crowds, requiring multiple services. The idea of multiple services was really kind of a new idea, you know, at the time. But Spurgeon was having to give it because that particular chapel just simply couldn't accommodate all the people who were coming. And so they moved him to the largest public gathering space in London at the time, the Royal Surrey Gardens Music Hall. This is, this is what the London Times said of Charles Spurgeon. Fancy a congregation consisting of 10,000 souls streaming into the hall, mounting the galleries. Mr. Spurgeon ascended to his tribune. To the hum and rush and trampling of men succeeded a low, concentrated thrill and murmur of devotion, which seemed to run at once like an electric current through the breast of everyone present. And by this magnetic chain, the preacher held us fast bound for about two hours." It is not my purpose to give a summary of his discourse. It is enough to say of his voice that its power and volume were sufficient to reach everyone in that vast assembly. Remember, this is before, this is before, you know, sound systems. This is before mics. 10,000 people could hear him easily in that hall. Of his language, that it is neither high flown nor homely. Of his style, that it is at a time familiar, at times declamatory, but always happy and often eloquent, of his doctrine that neither the Calvinist nor the Baptist appeared in the forefront of the battle which is waged by Mr. Spurgeon with relentless animosity and with gospel weapons against irreligious hypocrisy, pride, and those secret bosom sins which so easily beset a man in daily life. And to sum up all in a word, it is enough to say, of the man himself, that he impresses you with a perfect conviction of his sincerity. What a wonderful description of Charles Spurgeon in his preaching. So popular was he that in 1857, at the request of Queen Victoria, 
The 23-year-old Charles Spurgeon electrified a crowd at the Crystal Palace, a crowd of 23,000 people came to hear him speak. And again, they could all hear him easily. They came to hear him at the Crystal Palace where he gave a sermon on the first day of creation, just electrified the crowd. And although there's no indication that Spurgeon or Marx ever met, they absolutely had to know of each other. And that is because each was famous in his own lifetime. While Spurgeon's fame eclipsed that of Marx in the, uh, well, during the 1850s and 1860s, Marx's message of secular salvation gained in prominence after the publication of the first volume of Das Kapital in 1867. And I promise you that Charles Spurgeon was aware of it. I think that there's a certain politeness that comes through in his sermons where he discusses socialism, where they don't name individuals. That's just kind of the propriety of the time. They had moved on from the days of Martin Luther, who referred to Henry VIII as a hound from hell. You know, he named him personally. You go and read some of the some of the correspondence of the Reformation. It's it's amazing how vicious some of that some of that stuff is. Uh, they're a little more polite by the time you get to Charles Spurgeon. So, but he seems to be referring to him. And um, surely they were aware of each other because they're, they're preaching competing visions of humanity in the same London at the same time. And um, it's interesting to, to, to note this, that Engels, again, Marx's colleague, he expressed frustration that there wasn't this revolution wasn't coming in London. He says, why isn't it coming? And he said, this in a, he said this in a letter, and he said, the reason is one word. Do you know what he said? Spurgeon. He says, we are trying to reach the urban poor with our message. He didn't say this, but it's what it is. Message of hate. And unfortunately, this guy named Charles Spurgeon, he's out there attracting the same people by the tens of thousands to hear his messages of peace and love and contentment in the person of Jesus Christ. If we could get this guy out of the way, our message should take, should take off. And that, by the way, should encourage you because the great enemy of fascism, of socialism, of any, any totalitarian ideology is the Christian faith. The Christian faith is the bulwark against these evil ideologies. Of that, there is no doubt. And that is why, in order to protect any, any nation, any family, any person's heart, and there is, in a sense, a kind of national heart, in order to fortify our hearts and minds against evil ideologies, you must do it with the word. You must do it with the Christian faith. There's a reason why the Apostle Paul, he speaks frequently of, you know, of, you know, don't be deceived. Jesus spoke of this, of don't be deceived. There will be some who will arise who will even lead away the elect. I mean, that should scare you. And if you really want to in, inoculate your heart and mind against these things, you must do it with Scripture. You must do it with scripture. You must do it with by rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how you protect yourselves, how you protect your children. It's how you protect your family. And it is how a nation itself is protected. And it's why, by the way, and I think I will do a podcast on this. I think I'm going to title the podcast, Where's the Church? Have you wondered where is the church? We have all this that's going on and the real interesting stuff that is taking place in defending the United States and the West against evil, defending children against pedophiles, the real interesting stuff is being done by people outside of the church. It's being done on podcasts like this one. It's being done by writers who are, who are out there publishing in secular media. It's being done by people who are, who are going into the arena and taking on all comers and whose basis is a Christian worldview for the most part. That's what's happening, and, and so it's important that you understand that Charles Spurgeon stood like Gandalf. Isn't it Gandalf who says, you shall not pass? 
that was Charles Spurgeon. That was one man. What could happen in a nation full of Charles Spurgeons? Interesting to consider that. Spurgeon was out there hammering away. And you may think, but was he really knowledgeable and aware of the ideology? Oh, he was. For him, Charles Spurgeon did not pull the kind of nonsense that a lot of preachers pull today, where they basically see a man's Christian life like a pie chart. And they say the Christian faith applies to everything but this little sliver, politics. And they say, well, we're not political. We don't get into that. Really? Dietrich Bonhoeffer did. Charles Spurgeon did. <laughs> What's funny about Charles Spurgeon is that Charles Spurgeon, like a Roman charioteer, he not only did he not observe the various lanes of life, you know, here's politics and here's sex and here's family and all that. He he drove, <laughs> he drove his his chariot in which his pulpit sat <laughs> across every lane. Every lane. Because he saw the Christian faith for what it is. And those are in the words of Dutch theologian and statesman of, of the previous century, Abraham Kuyper, who said this, there's not one square inch of human existence to which Jesus Christ does not look, does not point and say, that's mine. In other words, a Christian faith that doesn't apply to your whole life isn't a complete Christian faith. It should apply to every aspect of our lives. We fail, we sin, we make... But don't ever say, well, but I'm not political. Well, what you're saying is you're a coward. What you're saying is you choose not to engage. And Charles Spurgeon did. And he did on socialism because he saw it for what it was. And that is atheism masquerading as political philosophy. I make that point in my book, The Grace Effect, which you can find on Amazon and find book retailers everywhere. I hope you will buy it and distribute it to all of your friends and neighbors. I explain what socialism is in that, and I do it through story. He actually, Spurgeon actually, saw the dangers of socialism early on. In 1855, he warned of communists who wanted nothing less than, quote, the real disruption of all society as it is presently established. That's a good description of communist agitators. He asked um, on one Sunday morning, in his preaching, he said, would you desire reigns of terror here as they had in France? Do you wish to see all society shattered and men wandering like monster icebergs on the sea, dashing against each other and being at last utterly destroyed? Because this is what socialism is. He saw it for that. In a sermon on Psalm 18 in June of 1878, Spurgeon made a tentative prediction to his congregation. This is what he said. German rationalism, which has ripened into socialism, may yet pollute the mass of mankind and lead them to overturn the foundations of society. I say not that it will be so, but I should not wonder if it came to pass, for deadly principles are abroad and certain ministers are spreading them. You think Spurgeon knew what socialism was? Did you hear Tim Keller give a message like this? Absolutely not. The late Tim Keller. God rest his soul. The man did much good of that, I'm sure. Tim Keller embraced a soft socialism and Marxism. And it made me wonder, I wrote an article about this that you can find on my website at LarryAlexTaunton.com. Keller foolishly began embracing it and he began embracing a woke ideology that is the opposite of the gospel. It is actually hostile to gospel. And as I've said on this podcast, it's because it's about retribution, not grace. It is about revenge, not restoration, not forgiveness. None of that exists in woke ideology. It has nothing in common with scripture. And I never heard or read Tim Keller consistently denouncing socialism for what it was. He seemed to accept, as all socialists throughout all time do, that what we've seen of socialism thus far is really just, it hasn't been done right. That's always the claim. Lenin didn't do it right. Stalin didn't do it right. Mao didn't do it right. 
We've never really seen it, seen it tried. Oh, but we have. And again, 150 million dead. Body bags. The path to socialism, the path to utopia always leads through a field pitted with mass graves. That's a fact. Whenever you move away from the gospel, whenever you move away from the dignity of humanity, which socialism does not believe in because it doesn't believe in God, it's fundamentally atheistic. And once you do that, then you accept the idea by default that human beings have no more value than any other animal on the face of the earth. That's where you arrive. And that's why all socialist states view human beings as nothing but raw material for the building of the perfect socialist state, which of course there's never been or ever will be. And this is why Spurgeon was condemning it. That's why he was preaching against it. Does Russell Moore do that? Does Russell Moore preach against it? David French? No, no. These, these people are enemies of the faith. They're enemies of the Christian faith. In a sermon on Isaiah 66, in April 1889, Spurgeon, recognizing that many had confused the gospel of Jesus Christ with this cheap, secular knockoff, proclaimed that Marx and his ilk were themselves promoting evil. He said, for many a year, by the grand old truths of the gospel, sinners were converted and saints were edified, and the world was made to know that there is a God in Israel. But these are too antiquated for the present cultured race of superior beings. Listen to his sarcasm in that. They are going to regenerate the world by democratic socialism and set up a kingdom for Christ without the new birth and without the pardon of sin. The latter-day gospel is not the gospel by which we were saved, to me, it seems a tangle of ever-changing dreams. It is, by the confession of its inventors, the outcome of the period, the monstrous birth of a boasted progress, the scum from the cauldron of conceit. It has not been given by the infallible revelation of God. It does not pretend to have been. It is not divine. It has no inspired scripture at its back. It is, when it touches the cross, an enemy. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon pulled no punches when he spoke of socialism. And I, there are some who, who glorify you know, Spurgeon in a way that I find slightly uncomfortable. My faith is ultimately in Jesus Christ, and Spurgeon was a flawed man like the rest of us. But I do want to hold up Spurgeon's preaching here. It's like you think something is white, and then you hold it against a swatch that is white. Spurgeon's sermon here is white. And there are a lot of people who are, are following that which is a dingy white, thinking it's white. And when you set it right alongside the, the false promises of Marxism, the false promises of, of socialism, the false promises of the World Economic Forum, of the Biden administration, when you set that up against sound preaching, you see it for what it is. It's exposed for what it is. He saw it as an enemy. It must be noted where Spurgeon laid the blame for the state of things. Like Francis Schaeffer a century later, he placed it squarely on the men of his own vocation. Now, in a, a previous podcast, I quoted from Ezekiel 9, where the Lord sends six ex executioners wielding their flaming swords into Jerusalem, and he says, strike everyone down on whom there is not a mark on the forehead. But he says, begin at my sanctuary. In other words, begin with the clerical class who are leading the people away into pagan and false worship. That's where Spurgeon went. That's where Francis Schaeffer went. Francis Schaeffer, by the way, is somebody that I should also mention is worth reading. He died in 84 of cancer, great loss. But he reads today just like he wrote it yesterday. I'll also add, so does Augustine. <laughs> so does Augustine, writing in the 4th and 5th centuries. I mean, Augustine still reads fresh and relevant. Anyway, um, Spurgeon was hammering our way at this. And I should add this. I have met many, if not the most famous atheists of our own time outside of Kim, Kim Jong-un. I've engaged them. Some of them I have debated privately and publicly. And like 
every one of them that I have ever met, Karl Marx falls into the category of what Romans 1 calls haters of God. There are individuals who are haters of God. One simply doesn't set up idols and altars if he's anything else. You just don't set up an ideology that is in competition with God, that is in competition with Jesus Christ, unless that's what you are. And that's what socialism is. It's a competitor for the affections of God. It's a false God set up against the one true God and a great act of defiance. It's a golden calf offering men a counterfeit version of salvation. Marx himself wasn't unaware of this fact. He was not unaware of it. He also understood how some people, some people who called themselves Christians, some Christians even, could confuse the authentic for the false, and he sought to exploit it. This is what he said. Nothing, he wrote in the Communist Manifesto, is easier than to give Christian asceticism a socialist tinge. In other words, he said, we can, like a sock puppet, we can enter into the church, we can hijack doctrine, we can hijack the appearance of piety, of Christian piety, but in fact, it's not Christian at all. It's socialist. He says, nothing easier in the world than to do that. You can lead a lot of Christians, don't know their Bibles particularly well, you can lead them astray like a Pied Piper. They'll follow it. They'll follow the preaching and teaching and the speaking of a Beth Moore, of a Russell Moore, of a David French, and of the late preaching and teaching of the late Tim Keller on this subject. A young Karl Marx, full of hate for God, wrote these lines in a poem. Listen to this. Startling. Did he know there was a God? Oh, I think so. So a God has snatched from me my all in the curse and rack of destiny. All his worlds are gone beyond recall. Nothing but revenge is left to me. I shall build my throne high overhead, cold and trembling shall its summit be. Wow. And in another poem, he dreamt of bringing disaster upon mankind. This is what he wrote then I will be able to walk triumphantly like a god through the ruins of their kingdom. Every word is fire in action. My breast is equal to that of the creator. This sounds a lot like the passage of scripture where Satan says, I shall make myself like the most high. In fact, I would say one of two things are going on here. Either Karl Marx was plagiarizing Satan or Satan was speaking through him. Maybe a bit of both. That's what I think is going on here. For this reason, Spurgeon combated Marx and his ideas the way the apostle John had once opposed Serinthus. Serinthus, it's speculated that, you know, that John was writing, if not his gospel, then his epistles combating Serinthus, who was pushing a Gnostic heresy. And Spurgeon also reminds me of one of the greatest, greatest apologists of all, my hero, Augustine, St. Augustine, who was pounding away with the gospel, going against guys like Pelagius, going against guys like that. Spurgeon, you can picture him thundering this from his pulpit before a crowd of 10,000. This is what he said. Great schemes of socialism have been tried and found lacking. Let us look to regeneration by the Son of God, and we shall not look in vain. That's John 14, 6. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is saying, anywhere else, you're looking in vain. You look to socialism for salvation, you're looking in vain. You look to your 401k, you're looking in vain. You're looking to Donald Trump, you are looking in vain. You're looking to any politician, you're looking in vain. Look to Jesus Christ and you will not look in vain. It's very likely that the preaching of Charles Spurgeon and others who are like him, he wasn't the only one of his time, he's just the most famous, the most remembered. It's very likely that their preaching, their fervent preaching, and their engagement to the culture, their fierceness to engage with courage, with steadiness, with resolve, and with their hope in Jesus Christ, that they together prevented viol violent revolution in Britain. 
What happened in France with the French Revolution of 1789, which led to the, to the, um, to the reign of terror, never happened in Britain. And it's because there was no comparable preaching in France. There wasn't. There was largely a dead Catholic church. It was a vibrant evangelical church in the days of Charles Spurgeon in the 19th century. And they were willing to go after this. Had they said, as many preachers today would do, if they had said, well, we don't engage in politics. We just do soup kitchens. We just do mission trips. We just do vacation Bible school. Had they said that, I think you could confidently say there would have been a revolution in Britain. I think you could confidently say that Marx's ideology would have brought about the unrest among the working class that he and Engels were seeking to produce. But they saw that Spurgeon was the guy who was preventing it, which is to say <laughs> that Jesus Christ was preventing it through the preaching of guys like Spurgeon. Do you know when, do you know when the Industrial Revolution hit Russia? Not until the first of the five-year plans in the 1920s. They were full, almost a full two centuries behind the West. That's how backward Russia was. And the revolution that Marx had predicted, not in Russia, he saw it happening in the West, didn't happen there, it happened in Russia. Backward Russia. Backward czarist Russia, according to Robert Conquest, Stanford University, in his book, The Great Terror, he says roughly 30 million people died as a result of utopian socialism. Alexander Solzhenitsyn says, nope, more like 60 million. And that's to say nothing of the people that they killed who weren't yet born. You know, in other words, who would never be born because generations were wiped out. Families were wiped out. Sergei Vitas said this. He said the reason the revolution happened, and you'd think he would point to a lot of different, you know, the police or the army weren't strong enough or something. He said it's because we became less Christian. We became less Christian. According to Orlando Figes, Cambridge historian Orlando Figes, he's written a terrific book called A People's Tragedy. It's about the Russian Revolution. I highly recommend it. Have no idea what what um, Fige's own um, religious views are. I'm going to guess secularist, like just about every other scholar or everybody else in Britain. But he said this. When Marx's Das Kapital was approved for publication in Russia, and almost nothing was, almost nothing got past the censors in Russia. But they looked at it, the censors looked at it with all of its factory data and so on. And they were like, nobody's going to read this. And they'd suppressed almost any good literature in Russia. But they did let Das Kapital get into the country and be published. And because, because there was really nothing else, socialists in Russia quickly made it a um, holy writ for them. And Fai just says this. He says that the success of Russian socialists, that is to say Bolsheviks, communists, Marxists, whatever you like to call them, he says it's due to the fact that socialist ideology was released into an ideological vacuum. He says there were no viable competing ideologies. Think about that for a second. That's the success, the triumph of Marxism in Russia, the rise of a totalitarian state was wholly due to the fact that there were no viable competing ideologies. You see, while, while Das Kapital had been published in the West, there were loads of viable competing ideologies. Moreover, there was a robust Christianity to critique it. There were people whose hearts and minds were fortified to say, this is nonsense. Not in Russia. Not in Russia. There were no viable competing ideologies. And that's, that's the reason that it instantaneously, almost, gained this, this cult-like status in its following. Not in the West. And that is because it was subjected to withering attacks 
from guys like Spurgeon and others. In a sense, in this sense, this is what I mean, that the Christian faith, even Richard Dawkins, by the way, said this. After the two of us had had, a, uh, had an exchange in which he was, I don't even remember what it was exactly we were talking about. This has been more than a decade ago. But I had said to him that the Christian faith that he was attacking had served as a bulwark against evil ideologies. And it was interesting because shortly thereafter, he gave an interview with the Times of London in which he said, I've mixed feelings about the decline of the Christian faith because it has served as a bulwark <laughs> against, you know, barbaric ideas. I don't remember exactly the way he put it, but he used that phrase, a bulwark, the same one that I'd used in my discussion with him. A meaning that even an unbeliever like him began to see that defanging the Christian faith was going to lead to the rise of totalitarian ideologies. And that's what happened in Russia. That's what happened in, in Asia, where there really wasn't a viable Christianity. There is now in China a growing Christian faith in China. But there wasn't in Russia, and there wasn't in parts of Africa, in dead church in South America. Today, the battle continues between these two ideologies. And the battlefield has expanded from London, the London of Marx and Spurgeon, it has expanded to the entire world. And Marxism, it morphs as it goes, disguising itself until it reaches our very own time in the sheep's clothing of racial equality, equity, and so-called social justice. The gospel, however, is <laughs> so wonderful, it remains remarkably unchanged. Its power to transform societies is one of the most underrated benefits of Christian belief. Through the inward transformation of the soul, of the individual, there's a corresponding outward transformation of society. That is to say, as we experience grace inwardly, we demonstrate it outwardly. We're changed as a result of that by God's grace. And it's what I call the grace effect, the book that I referred to earlier. This is an aspect of God's common grace. No greater scam has been perpetrated on so many for so long than the lie, the false promise of socialism. It promises that once you adopt it, that it will re reorganize society along the lines of utopia for all, complete nonsense. That utopia has killed no less, again, for the third time in this podcast, than 150 million people in the 20th century alone, more than all religious wars from all previous centuries combined. It is important you understand that. So political solutions have always failed. Doesn't mean political solutions don't matter. Doesn't mean you shouldn't engage. They do matter. But political solutions are always driven by ideologies. Ideas have consequences, either evil ideologies or good ideologies. And this one has led to nothing but catastrophe for every country. It's like the opposite of the Midas touch. Everything that socialism touches, it turns to crap. Just absolutely. So as Spurgeon so eloquently put it, he said this, to attempt national regeneration without personal regeneration is to dream of erecting a house without separate bricks. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my hope that you'll be like Charles Spurgeon. Take heart, engage. Do you have his talent? Perhaps not. Do you have his gifting? Perhaps not. Does it matter? Engage. Engage the culture because we serve a mighty God. We serve the God who said, let there be light. That should mean something to you.